Hey everybody, thanks for being with us. My name is Gary. I'm one of the pastors here at Summit. And our hope is that this sermon is helpful to you and is a resource to you in moving toward loving God and loving others. We also hope that it's helpful in making a connection with the church. There's some links below for that. And if you're in the Orlando area, we'd love for you to join us for one of our in-person worship services. If you're not in the Orlando area, our hope is that you would find a local church to be a part of and that this resource would be helpful for your growth, but wouldn't replace you being a part of a faith community. With that, thank you again for being with us. And the word of the Lord reads like this. We're going to be in Colossians 3, and I'm going to start at verse uh, 1. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed in him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever you, um, whatever is in you that is earthly, which is fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is considered idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you are also um, once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all of these things, things such as anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self and its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of the creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek, there is no longer Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive above all, clothe yourselves with love, a love that binds everything together in perfect harmony and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. And of course, be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your heart, sing psalms, sing hymns and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or even in your deeds, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, when I first became a youth minister, about 11 years, probably more so going on 12. I remember the first group of students that I had. It was a pretty large group, but this particular group was incredibly interested in apologetics. They, that's all they really wanted to talk about. And it was kind of my fault. I introduced that to them. Apologetics being the, this idea of defending your faith like defending your faith against atheists or people who are agnostic, people who just did not believe in your God or in your Jesus, I introduced that to them and they became obsessed with it. And I remember on Sunday mornings when we would meet, sometimes even on Wednesday nights when we would meet, that's all they wanted to do. They wanted to play this devil, devil's advocate game that we used to do where I would just stand in front of the class and they would throw these biblical arguments my way and I would try to destroy them with secular thought. Um, of me playing the atheist and them trying to prove to me that God is real. You know, this specific idea of spiritual formation at this time of my life, I believed was the best way to garner attention for Jesus. And I even believe that this type of debate and argument style classroom setting would be a sustaining mechanism that would keep students engaged as well as show them the beauty of Jesus. Well, again, that was about... 12 years ago, um, and all of those students are full adults now. Um, some of them, most of them have careers, some of them have spouses, um, a lot of them have children. 
And if I were to be honest about that paradigm in which we live during that time, I can truly say that in those early years of ministry, I probably missed the mark. Because what I have come to realize in being a Christ follower is that the real question is not does God exist? or not uh, was Jesus more than just a historical figure. The real question is always, if these ideas of God or Jesus, if those things are true, then what does that say about the ways in which I should live my life? What does it ask of us? The former question resides in the aisles of theory. You know, does God exist? Is he real? Are you guys just pretending to talk to some big master in the sky who does not care about the affairs of humanity? That is always impacted by just theory, while the latter question forces you to deal with the moral and ethical questions that impact our everyday life. This is evident in our reading this morning of Colossians 3. Greek and New Testament professor Dr. Lloyd A. Lewis suggests that Paul's theological indicative is stated in chapters one and two, and has now formed the foundation for his ethical imperatives in the concluding chapters. That you can surmise that Paul's grand theology here calls for a higher ground for the sake of communal preservation, that he is calling for us to be better, that he's calling for us to become higher and to think clearly. That in other words, that if you're going to be an apprentice of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, then that calling comes with a set of imperatives for the contemplative self. It calls for you to be a new person, a new creature. Paul takes us from biblical theology to biblical living in this text. In the beginning of chapter three, he begins by painting a beautiful picture that mixes both kind of this anthropological reality with metaphorical explanation. That the idea that if Jesus died and then got up from the grave with all power in his hand, then the truth is not just a tale meant to be told for the sake of odyssey or myth. It is a story that reimagines the nature of what it means to be a human. That we, according to Paul, died as well to our old selves And then according to his theology, that in our death, we also were raised to life with Christ. And now we have a new self. You know, I know that that can be a tad confusing um, to understand. So I'm going to explain that using the great cinematic masterpiece, Big Hero 6. Now, I don't know if you've seen Big Hero 6. I might be spoiling it for you. So it came out many years ago. So if you haven't seen it. It's an indictment on you, really, and not me. You should probably go check that out. But there is this beautiful scene in the movie where the friends have just come together after this kind of horrible incident. And the brother, the main character, Hero, he's uh, having this conversation with the friends, and he's just talking about how they could avenge the death of his brother. He's angry, and he needs answers. And so he's having this conversation of how we, he, how we all can come together and avenge the death of his brother. And one of the characters interrupts him while he's saying all of this, and she goes, Hero, I, I understand what you're saying, but we're we're just us, nerds, we're, we're just us. You're, you're asking a lot of us, Hero, but we're just students, we're, we're us. And, and Hero, the best line in the whole movie, after she's done stating that, he looks her dead in the face and, and he goes, oh no, you can be so much more. Then there is this entire montage of Hero's brilliance, right? Where he's looking at all of his friends and he's turning them into superheroes. He's taking their brilliance and what they're good at and he's using that thing to make them more than what they were. He's giving them super suits and he's turning them into superheroes. Only a preacher can look at a movie like Big Hero 6 and glean spiritual truths from it. Now, the thing about Hero and his friends was that even after all of that brilliance, right, even after they were given these super suits, even after their genius and their brilliance was turned into a superpower, they were still themselves. 
They were still students. They were still scared. It, it's still, they were still complicated human beings. They still had their own personalities. They still had their flaws. But the point is, they came in contact with somebody that gave them something that they can put on top of those complications. Now, that doesn't mean that I am preaching a gospel in which you're supposed to come into these four walls and put on a mask and put on a suit and pretend your way through this faith. That's, that's not what it means to be in a princess of Jesus. However, what I am saying is that just like these students in this particular movie, that when we come in contact with Jesus, that when we die to self and when we are resurrected with Christ, when we come in contact with the brilliance of Jesus, yes, we still live in that tension of our humanity. We still live in that tension of the complications of what it means to be a human. But because we came in contact with the brilliance of Jesus, we now have something that we can put on. We now have something that allows for us to radiate properly when we, are, when we are in public, that other people know that you are a human, but they see you've been worked on. They see a difference. They see you as this new thing, that we have now died to old self and we have put new selves on. That this is what Paul does in the portion of this letter. He admonishes the people of God by telling them, oh, just like Hero told his friends, oh, but you all can be so much more. You can be more than this. That greed, you can be more than that. That, that level of impurity and not this full and embodied ethic you can be more than that. You know, and in reading this text, it would seem that there are three phrases, three points that Paul uses in the beginning of this portion of the letter that explains this new humanity and the ways in which we should live. When we read the text, uh, the first phrase uh, that we see is in verse three, this very simple phrase for you have died. That is this gut-wrenching realization of philosophical exploration of what it means to die to yourself, that in order for us to know how to truly live, then we must learn how to truly and properly die, dying to those things that have propped up and sustained that old man type language that Paul uses in the text. And I love that Paul writes this notion in a past tense sense which indicates the finished work that has already been done in you, that he preaches a gospel of new man from old man because the work actually has already been done, which suggests this realization that freedom is something you can walk in right now, that you don't have to wait for it. For the work of the killing of the flesh has been done that even when we see the word in its original language, that, that idea of dying to self, that word apothenesco, a word that stresses the significance of the separation that comes with divine closure. I love that so much that that word suggests that there must be in dying to yourself a divine closure, that Paul uses a word and a phrase that suggests that when this thing in us erodes away and dies, what is resurrected in you is something that is new and better for your growth. A divine closure that always comes with divine replacement. That when one door closes, the things that were behind that door needed to go away. That, that door needed to be closed. But when God does a resurrection type work within the individual, when that door closes, there is this new door of replacement, divine replacement. Now, the question is, in reading this text, then Johnny, then what is Paul asking us to, to die to? Let's get out of the land of theory and let's actually get real and practical here. OK, so Paul is telling us to become new people from our old selves and that we must die to this thing. So what are the things that we must die to? I love that. So if we go back to the text, it states to put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly. What are those things that are earthly? 
Paul tells us. Fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry. On the account of all of these things, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. That these are the ways you once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of a very, a, a few specific things. Those things being anger, those things being wrath, those things being malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth that he is telling us to no longer lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped your old self away from your new self. You see, the counsel of scripture is this full embodied reality that has something to say about you in your entirety. That scripture, that following Jesus, being an apprentice of Jesus, it has something to say about who you are in your entirety. It, it has something to say about how, who you allow in your intimate spaces. It has something to say about those evil and immoral thoughts that you are consumed with, that scripture is a dense and complex book with complex intentions and ideas. But one thing about it that is simple is this idea that living with a new humanity causes you to put everything about you in question. That to die to self, one must be good at the work of questioning themselves. And when I mean everything, I legitimately mean everything. That this especially applies to the Christians who love to stay at the top of that verse of verse five and are always concerned with who someone is sleeping with and their sexuality. But for some reason, you slide right past anger, wrath, malice, slander and abusive language. That you love to stay up there. To judge the full embodiment of other people their sexuality, who they're with, their partners. But when it comes down to the rest of that, of the type of words that are coming out of your mouth, slander, malice, anger, wrath, the abuse of language, that you have so many deep thoughts about another person's body, but you have no control over your tongue and anger and ability to engage with people holistically, that you've become awkward when it comes to engaging with someone who lives a life differently than you, but for some reason, that awkwardness just goes away when it's time to slander them behind their backs. That the thing about this text and these, these things that we're supposed to die from is that all of it, according to Paul, is considered idolatry. That it is the understanding that everybody in this room has an idol on the altar of their hearts. And that this idol sometimes gets way more press and way more attention than Jesus. That if we're going to truly walk alongside Jesus, idols must die. Idols must be destroyed. And all things must come under submission of the new humanity in which we live. There was this panel at the great Dr. Cornell West was a part of a few years ago, and a question was posed um, to the entire panel, but they decided they wanted Dr. Cornell West to, to uh, answer it. And the question was, how do you get someone who has lost their faith in God to care about God again? How do you get somebody who has lost their faith completely? How do you get them to fall in love with God again, to, to fall in love with Jesus again? And I love the brilliance of Dr. Wes. I, I love his brilliance is because he paused and then he, he went at it from this particular angle. He said, you see, I come from a spiritual tradition where a certain type of atheism is actually healthy. He continues to say that because at least what atheism does is that it cleans the deck and allows for your questions, the questions that you have, if you truly have a problem with God, or has there been an idol in your heart in place of where God should have been? Again, let me say, he says, what atheism does is that it cleans the deck and it allows for you to ask the, the critical question, am I mad at God? Or am I mad at the thing that I turned into a God? Am I mad at the very thing 
that has been a distraction masquerading as holy. And the thing is, we know as followers of Christ, is that the only way to get rid of the thing masquerading as holy, the thing that is masquerading as a God in your life, is you got, you got to kill it. You have to put it out to pasture. You have to die to self, put it on a cross and let it die. We see the second phrase that Paul uses to prove his point of old humanity and new humanity. And he says, but even in death, there's good news because that, that second phrase that Paul uses to show us the new humanity, he does this in verse one, another very simple statement. He says, you have been raised with Christ. So the first one, you've died. The second one, you have been raised with Christ. That, that Greek word, sunugero, to be raised, that the, when we look at that word, it suggests the communal nature of being lifted out of moral death to a new blessed life devoted to God. That when you destroy and put on a cross this thing that needs to die, when we look at that word, for you've been raised with Christ, sunagero, it gives this picture of after death, you've been lifted out of moral decay. And that new man is now showing. You know, the first time I truly came face to face with this type of fleshed out theological framework, was with one of my mentors, Dr. Brian Stamper. You know, he used to do this amazing job in his preaching at explaining the power that we now have because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection power has been bestowed upon us because of the work of the resurrection, that the resurrection is not just merely a theory, this thing that we celebrate on Easter. No, it is this idea of new humanity. That this isn't just a heavenly realization that when we die, we are now alive in Christ. And that's not just in future tense but to have power, resurrection power in the now, to be lifted, that's, that's, a, that's a present tense understanding of the resurrection. That right now, you can live with new humanity. That you can put your anger to death and right behind that becomes the life of joy. That you can put fornication to death and right behind it comes the life of a deep care of your body and who you give it to. You can put greed to death and right behind that death comes the life of stewardship and benevolent giving. You can put abusive language to death and right behind it comes the life of speaking life into peace. People. We see the truth of this in verse 10 when Paul states, for you have clothed yourselves. I love that language. It's, it's big hero six language. They went from just being them, nerds, college students. But in all that brilliance, they receive this new self that is a part of them that they have been clothed. Clothed, something you put on and you put on to leave, leave the home. It's something that is on you, that you have clothed yourselves with new self, which is being renewed and knowledge according to the image of its creator. That in verse 11, it states that in that renewal, there is no longer Greek or Jew. There is no longer circumcised and uncircumcised. There is no longer barbarian or Scythian, slave or free. But when you are in Christ, Christ is in you. And if Christ is in you, we are able to see how. We are able to see the fruit of what it means for Christ to be in you. And the only way to get fruit, the only, the only way to do the gardening work of showing fruit means that you are plucking weeds. You're putting things to death. And when you're plucking weeds and you're putting things to death, you're planting new seeds new growth, new things, resurrection-based life. That when you've been raised, there is a new you. Now imagine if we all did a bunch of moral and ethical resurrections right now. 
Imagine if we all got together and decided to die to those toxic, corrupt, problematic things that keep us down, that, that keep us in this particular flesh. What if we decided communally as a body of Christ to die to these things together and resurrect together, that we become more communal, that you are no longer a city and you are my brother because why? We were raised together. You are not just Jewish or Greek. No, sir. No, ma'am. We are brothers in in Christ. We are kinfolk now. Oh, you used to be greedy? Me too. Oh, you used to use abusive language and talk about people behind their backs and never lifting them up, but always tearing them down? Me too. New self, right? We're in this together. That we're family now. That in the words of Hero from Big Hero 6, Baby, we can be so much more than what we are now. Not preaching a gospel of perfection. We will always live in tension. But even in tension, baby, we can be so much more. We can be more than this. You know, Paul's third phrase that pushes us into the realization of a new humanity is that we see in verse 2, after you need to die to flesh, you need to die to this thing, and then you need to resurrect this third phrase, kind of puts a bow on top of this where he says, set your minds on. That Greek word phroneo, to set your mind onto something is where we get the idea of setting your minds on things that are above and not earthly, problematic, toxic distractions. That this word paints a picture of someone involved in public affairs or, or someone who is being asked to take their flag and choose a side. What are you going to focus on? What are you going to set your mind on? You've died to flesh. You've been resurrected with Christ. Now, what does that say about how you should be living your life? That when you are setting your minds on things that are above, you are drawing a line in the sand and stating, I will not be moved. And I love Paul because, again, this is a fundamental basic letter to this very small church that he does not leave this. He does not leave that idea up to our own interpretation or theory of what is considered above thinking. He actually tells us of what does it mean to live a life in which you are thinking above. Because a lot of people mistake this type of language of like, you know what, this earth, man, it's just a lot going on right now. So I'm heavenly minded. Uh, I'm screaming Maranatha. I I'm screaming for the Lord to come back and Lord, just take me away from this place. I don't want to do any work. I, I don't want to be a part of this, Lord. I've just given up. You know, I'm heavenly minded. So Lord, just take me away. That that's not what Paul is saying. If you believe that you've completely missed the mark, what Paul is talking about in order to have a heavenly mindset, that means that you understand that you are God's beautiful chosen one, that you matter, that you are holy and that you are beloved and that you have to, on this side of the Jordan, while you are on earth, clothe yourselves, put on what? Compassion, humility, kindness, meekness, patience, and not only those, but Paul talks about where a lot of us are really toxic. Not only is he saying put those things on, he's saying when you put those clothes on, it should allow for you to do this thing that I'm going to tell you in verse 13, that you learn how to bear with one another. And if, and if anyone has a complaint against another, you have to learn how to forgive them. You see, this is why that dying to flesh language is so important, because right now there are some of you who are hearing this who are cringing because you're like, I have to do what? I, I got to be kind and be humble. And not only that, that's not just an individual endeavor. I have to use those tools now for the sake of the body and community. I have to learn how to bear with one another. I love that language to bear because it's this idea painting a picture that no matter how annoying you become, I still have to do life with you and forgive you and give you chance after chance after chance. And then in 14, he really destroys you because he says, above all of 
of this, clothe yourselves with love, is because love is what binds all of those together. You can't uh, be kind to someone if you don't love them. You can't be humble to people if you don't have love. You can't truly show compassion if you have not tied that together with love. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called one body. So these are the commands that mess us up as Christians. There are many of us in this room that hear these qualities and you think of the places where you find it being fleshed out beautifully. You think about what it means to be humble and having compassion and kind and love. And you think about those places where you see that mostly. And there are many of you who are looking at me right now and you go, Johnny, that place would not be the church for me. I actually find the opposite there when I walk into people's churches. I find the opposite of compassion. I find the opposite of what it means to be humble. I find the opposite of love when I walk into these church spaces that we have lost or maybe we've never even had the ability to learn how to bear with one another, that we in this culture have this well-earned reputation of being a place where judgment, hatred, bigotry, impatience, and pride run rampant that we are currently living in a culture where millennials and Generation Z are leaving the church in droves and distancing themselves from Jesus, not because of Jesus himself, but because of the people that claim they love Jesus. There was this Barna Group study in 2018 that did a study that, that shows pure atheism in Gen Z has doubled. That in 2022, it looks as if about 49% of younger generations are no longer affiliated with religion whatsoever. And, and what is the biggest reason behind this? Because we have done a poor job in exegeting Paul's words in verse 12 through 15, that our definition of holy this entire time has been synonymous to perfection that our definition of what it means to be pure and holy has never been synonymous to compassion and understanding. That it is synonymous to being kind and humbling yourself. That's what holy means. Holy is not some like I'm perfect, I just have it. No, we've, 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 we've really co-opted that term. Holy means that you love people. Holy means that you are patient. If you really want to know if you are in step with the Lord, if you really want to know if you are in tune with Jesus, one of the greatest ways is for you to assess your ability to be patient. Assess your ability to bear with people. Assess your ability to forgive. I'm preaching to myself right now. Assess your ability to soften your heart for the sake and the beauty of relationship. That when you have died that hard but necessary moral death, that when you've been resurrected with Christ and received the resurrection power, we now enter into this beautiful sanctification process of what it means to set your mind on. So what are you setting your minds on? What beautiful and holy things are being produced from your presence in the body of Christ? Are you a distraction? Are you a problem? Are you operating in old self? Do you refuse to walk in new self? When we do all of this, we see what comes. We see the conclusion of what comes from operating in this that, that Paul gives us uh, almost like a benediction in verse 16 and 17 that he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your heart, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, that this is what the body of Christ actually looks like. That when we heed to these ancient and sacred words, when Jesus and his words dwell richly in our hearts, when we are concerned with one another's death, when we are concerned with one another's resurrection, and when we are concerned with other people's spiritual formation, it always brings us back to God. It's what this whole thing is for, that when we have a depth in our pursuit of holiness together, because this is a together thing, I can't pursue holiness by myself. 
that when we pursue holiness together as a church, we find ourselves edifying one another, which if we edify one another properly, that is uh, what my mentor, Dr. Brian Stamper, used to say, that is a sweet aroma to God. That when we learn how to love each other properly, we are actually glorifying God. And when we glorify God properly, when we do life with each other properly, when we look at verse 17 of that painting, that picture of holding hands and singing songs and hymns to the Lord, that we, that is what bearing with each other looks like. That is what doing life with each other looks like. That is what we are called to do as the church, that we find ourselves at the feet of Jesus, that sweet aroma, that we're doing life with one another and basking in this beautiful new humanity that we are called to live in. So the critical question, again, from the beginning, I'm no longer interested in that question of does God exist? I'm no longer interested in that question of is Jesus more than just a historical figure? What I am interested in is the real question, that if God does exist, If Jesus is more than just a historical figure, then what does that have to say about the life that I live? Let's pray. Father God, you are kind. And I pray that any ears, any hearts that are watching this on their television, on their phones, Lord, that it was able to permeate their hearts, that they're able to wrestle with this thing. Father God, as Christians, as people who call themselves apprentices of Jesus, Lord, let us reckon with what that actually means. That Lord, real Christians, real apprentices of Jesus, they understand what it means to be holy, that holiness actually means what type of person you are. How do you treat people? How do you act? Are you meek? Are you kind? Do you have compassion? And is it all tied together with love? And if there is somebody that is hearing this for the first time and their experiences have been the opposite of that, Father God, I pray, I pray that you send somebody their way that shows that loving Jesus is a love thing. It is an ethic of love. It is an ethic uh, of mutuality. Let us do this life well together. Be with us. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen.